Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I hope we had a good break. And uh, just as a quick reminder, please use these uh, QR codes uh, to get to the platform to, to use the Q&A tab to ask questions. And similarly, if you're participating online, um, use the Q&A tab as well. So it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Commissioner Caputo. The Honorable Annie Caputo was sworn in as a commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on August 9th, 2022, and is currently serving the remainder of a five-year term ending June 30th, 2026. Commissioner Caputo previously served on the NRC Commission from 2018 to 2021. Most recently, she worked as a consultant for the Idaho National Laboratory related to international collaboration on advanced nuclear reactors. Prior to her work at INL, she served as a professional staff member on the U.S. Armed Services Committee, assisting with issues related to National Nuclear Security Administration's infrastructure. She also served as a senior policy advisor to Chairman John Barrasso on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Commissioner Caputo held the same position for then Chairman James Inhofe from 2007 to 2012. And from 2005 to 2006, and 2012 to 2015, Commissioner Caputo worked for the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, handling nuclear energy issues. Prior to her positions on Capitol Hill, she worked for the Exelon Corporation. And a graduate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, she holds a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering. Commissioner. Thank you. Good morning. It is wonderful to be here in person and to see all of you. Um, it's also a great opportunity for those of you that can't be here to join us remotely in this hybrid rec. So thank you to all the employees who have made this such a successful event, both here and virtually. It's also wonderful to see so many of our international colleagues, some of whom I've already been able to meet with or, or chat with. I'm thrilled that you've made the travel to be here. It's a long distance for so many of you, um, but it's such a wonderful chance for us to meet and work together as international colleagues in our collective cause for nuclear safety. And I particularly want to call out uh, Director General Bill Magwood, an alumni of our institution, um, and Deputy Director Liddy Everard for being here from the IAEA. And it's also wonderful to see our former colleagues, Commissioner Austin Dorf, Commissioner Merrifield, Commissioner Barron was here earlier, I've lost him. Um, so thank you for all being here and, and for your service in the past and your continuing advice to all of us who continue to serve at the NRC. And like my predecessors have said, thank you to their staff. I am blessed with such a talented staff, and they are high performers, all of them, who, without whom I'd be lost. So a special thanks to Nicole, Heather, Marilyn, Julie, Kayla, and Eric. So thank you all for your service in my office. And a special thank you, it was kind of a surprise visit for me today. Uh, my son and daughter, Abigail and Owen, are here today. Uh, to cheer me on, and they are a special inspiration to me. I dearly love them. I'm thrilled to have them with me this morning. So um, let me just start by saying I really want to associate myself with Commissioner Wright's remarks. His heartwarming focus on our people and their work um, was just really inspirational. It's so important, that selfless service every day at the agency, and I really want to associate myself with, uh, with Commissioner Wright's remarks. And I appreciate the chairman for his focus on optimism and his remarks as well, recapping uh, a lot of what's going on at the agency. Um, I have to say, the theme for my remarks, if there is a theme, really focuses a lot more um, on a sense of urgency, um, I think, and, and a need to be more focused on results in our licensing decisions. So uh, with that, I will get down to business. Uh, NRC's goal is to become a modern, 
risk-informed regulator. And I think that can mean a lot of things, um, but what does it mean and why does it matter? And to me, it means we're focused on our core licensing and oversight work. Our regulatory actions are consistent with risk reduction achieved and are promptly, fairly, decisively administrated, lending stability to nuclear operations and planning. That we are agile and responsive to changes in the landscape, in keeping with the title for this, for this conference, and that we're making decisions without undue delay. And lastly, that in all we do, we are transparent, independent, but we are also externally aware and not isolated. So why do we need to become a modern risk-informed regulator? At last year's RIC, I discussed how the primacy of our mission to protect public health and safety and to promote the common defense and security and to protect the environment is indisputable. In focusing on that mission and the day-to-day -day work that supports it, it's easy to lose sight of the larger changing landscape and how we fit into, as an agency, how we fit into a much larger picture. Energy is the lifeblood of the economy, not just ours, the global economy and every nation in it. The challenge of transitioning away from fossil fuels is driving growth in electricity demand at home and abroad. Policymakers in the administration and Congress expect nuclear energy to play a significant role in meeting domestic and international clean energy needs. So we at the NRC are the gatekeeper for nuclear energy in the US. Whether nuclear energy will make a growing contribution to our nature's clean, nation's clean energy needs will depend on the posture with which we execute our safety and security mission. Given the NRC's global reputation for nuclear safety regulation and using risk information, the NRC should also be a leader in establishing best practices for reducing regulatory risk and improving the predictability and timeliness of our licensing reviews. This is why the NRC must become a modern risk-informed regulator. And to put this in context, I'm gonna take a few minutes to just scratch the surface of the, challenging, the challenge that's unfolding. Periodically, the commission meets with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to discuss issues um, where our work and our jurisdictions um, either touch or intersect. And so we do this meeting occasionally. Did this a few months ago, and one of the presentations was from the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, known widely as NERC. And um, the representative spoke on the 2023 long-term reliability assessment. So this has to do with grid reliability in the US and, well, in North America. Um, NERC notes that generator retirements are expected before sufficient re replacement resources will be in service. Their long-term reliability assessment indicates 117 gigawatts of new resource additions by 2023. But this is only slightly higher than 83 gigawatts of retirements. So there are other resource additions that are in the early stages of planning and may come onto the grid, but there are also additional fossil fuel retirements that are likely. So this leads FERC to conclude the imbalance of generator retirements and resource challenges and, and resource additions challenges the ability to serve growing demand. NERC also noted that there has been a sharp rise in demand and energy growth forecasts. And this is since their 2022 report just a year prior. So growth in electricity demand is accelerating. But what does that mean in practical terms? For one utility, 
a recent press report, notes that it is going to have to shift from 2% annual growth in demand to 6% annual growth in demand by 2028. That's not a lot of time to finance, permit, construct, and bring new generation online, much less if 6% demand growth becomes the new normal. So where is this growth in demand coming from? And the chairman touched on this somewhat. I'm going to provide a few more numbers and a little more context. One example that NERC listed is interconnection requests for 41 gigawatts just for cryptocurrency. Just cryptocurrency. So if the new resource additions NERC expects only exceed retirements by 34 gigawatts, the new resource additions will be fully consumed and then some just from cryptocurrency. What about electricity demand to support additional data centers? One study from the Boston Consulting Group estimates 28 gigawatts by 2030. In a different scenario, with a higher penetration of generative AI, could drive data centers to triple their current share of US electricity consumption. In addition to that, there is the effort to transition energy use in general away from fossil fuels and electrify the national economy. So I gave an example last year of cities seeking to electrify urban centers and shift their buildings away from natural gas. This would drive a huge growth in, in baseload generation needs. And then there are the ongoing efforts to decarbonize transportation. While much attention has been focused on electric vehicles, there are also efforts in trucking, freight trains, and global shipping. Whether these vehicles are electric powered or powered with a transportable fuel like hydrogen, these efforts are likely to drive growth in electricity demand. Going even further, heavy industries are exploring how to decarbonize. In Texas, Dow is currently partnering with X Energy to transition its energy use to nuclear at one of its facilities. But the steel industry is also looking at nuclear energy. Mining companies are looking for energy sources for remote locations where microreactors might fit the bill. Battery manufacturing is expected to drive growth in electricity demand in some parts of the country. Oil and gas producers are trying to shift away from the diesel power generation that powers their drilling fields and connect to the grid to reduce their emissions and their fuel costs. According to the Wall Street Journal, this is driving up electricity demand in New Mexico, Texas, and North Dakota. But some companies are unable to connect to the grid and are developing their own microgrids. So to summarize the national demand for electricity, generator retirements are expected before replacements are online, and growth in electricity demand is accelerating. And these dynamics lead NERC to conclude that a growing number of areas face capacity and energy risks in just the next 10 years. So as the chairman mentioned, an article from the Washington Post entitled, quote, amid explosive demand, America is running out of power. This article quoted a state public service commissioner saying, quote, when you look at the numbers, it is staggering. It makes you scratch your head and wonder how we ended up in this situation. How were the projections this far off? This has created a challenge like we have never seen before. This is a rapidly changing landscape. And everything I've discussed here is public information. You can begin to sense the scope and magnitude of the change that's unfolding. It also becomes clear why there's a consensus and a sense of urgency in Congress and the administration that nuclear energy must play a key role in meeting our nation's need for clean energy and energy security. 
In addition to the many efforts underway to spur nuclear energy development, the administration signed an agreement at COP28, which the chairman mentioned, the UN Conference on Climate Change in Dubai, an agreement to triple nuclear energy capacity by 2050. So COP28 was in December. New US, US nuclear generating capacity at the time was about 96 gigawatts. That calculates out to 192 gigawatts of new nuclear capacity over the next 26 years. Since then, Vogel 4 has started up. So 1.2 gigawatts down, 190.8 gigawatts to go. This is ambitious, to put it mildly. So Congress has also turned its attention to the NRC again pursuing legislation in both chambers with bipartisan support. Senators Capito, White House, and Carper have introduced the Advance Act in the Senate to support the licensing of advanced nuclear technologies to strengthen the domestic nuclear energy fuel cycle and supply chain and to improve the regulation of nuclear energy. Most recently, the House of Representatives passed their nuclear bill with a vote of 365 to 36. So for those of you who have a sense of just how contentious things are in Congress these days and in politics in general in this country, 365 House members voted in favor of this legislation, a remarkable bipartisan agreement. And here's the stated purpose of the House bill. H.R. 6544, the Atomic Energy Advancement Act would advance the benefits of nuclear energy by establishing requirements for the Nuclear Energy Commission to license and regulate nuclear energy technology in an efficient, predictable, and timely manner. 365 House members feel such a sense of urgency with regard to nuclear energy that they agreed on the need to establish requirements for us as an agency to be efficient, predictable, and timely. This legislation specifically directs the NRC to update its mission statement to include that licensing and regulation of nuclear energy activities be conducted in a manner that is efficient and does not unnecessarily limit the potential of nuclear energy to improve the general welfare and the benefits of nuclear energy to society. This indicates that indicates a conclusion that the NRC must become more efficient, predictable, and timely. At least in Congress's eyes, the NRC has not yet become the modern risk-informed regulator that they expect. So the theme for this conference is adapting to a changing landscape. And that's an important recognition that our landscape is changing. But it's not enough. Talking about it is not enough. In his book, Measure What Matters, John Doerr stresses Ideas are easy. Execution is everything. Results matter. And Congress's pursuit of legislation clearly reflects an expectation that improved performance on the part of NRC in recognition of the coming need for nuclear energy. So what's to be done? For the NRC, the path to improving execution, I believe, lies in getting back to basics, improving the agency's agility in the face of change, and focusing on achieving results. So I'm going to start with the basics. In 1974, Congress passed the Energy Reorganization Act when the country was facing a different energy transition. The declared purpose sounds similar to many of the goals our government and industries are pursuing today. So I'm quoting from the act. The Congress hereby declares that the general welfare and common defense and security will require effective action to develop and increase the efficiency and reliability of the use of all energy sources 
to meet the needs of present and future generations, to increase the productivity of the national economy and strengthen its position in regard to international trade, to make the nation self-sufficient in energy, to advance the goals of restoring, protecting, and enhancing environmental quality, and to assure the public health and safety. It was in this act that Congress established the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as the safety and security regulator for the civilian uses of nuclear technology. Again, I'll quote from the act, there are hereby transferred to the commission all the licensing and related regulatory functions of the Atomic Energy Commission. Thus, licensing was the only specifically enumerated function, effectively designating it as our principal function. So today, while the agency remains diligent in its oversight and inspection work, licensing reviews are a relatively small portion of the agency's activities. Over time, the related regulatory functions have come to dominate our operations. The cost of licensing reviews and inspections to ensure compliance are recovered from licensees and applicants. In 2016, this, since 2016, this work has fallen over 40%. In 2023, this licensing and oversight work comprised 21% of our budget and accounted for around 420 of our nearly 2,860 employees. And yet, there have been delays in some licensing reviews, specifically license renewals, due to a lack of staff resources. This means that licensing is competing for management attention with related regulatory functions that are funded by the other 79% of the budget. Another example is the NRC strategic plan. It contains 32 strategies, only one of which is directly related to licensing decisions. Promote risk-informed decision-making to result in effective and efficient oversight, rulemaking, and licensing and certification activities. These facts paint a picture of how licensing is not viewed as our priority. I believe we need to get back to basics, that leadership should be focusing and prioritizing efficient licensing reviews and effective oversight to make safe use of energy, ener nuclear energy possible. Improving our execution also requires improving the agency's agility. A common definition of organizational agility is the ability of an organization to qu adapt quickly to market changes and evolving customer demands. It involves flexible processes, rapid decision making, and a culture that embraces change and innovation. License renewal reviews faced a change in the landscape. The fact that staff resources are still lacking after two years, and in spite of hiring 600 new employees, raises concerns about our agility. It shows a need to improve our strategic hiring, our knowledge management, our versatility, and management focus to ensure we have the right skills at the right time to efficiently execute our workload. NRC employees, as David so well covered, are skilled and dedicated. I believe we need to do more to invest in them, whether they are new or have been with us for several years or many years. They are drawn by a commitment to public service and to our mission, but it's not clear we're giving them the training they need to develop or empowering them to fully contribute and be successful, whether they are environmental reviewers, project managers, or resident inspectors. Our knowledge management should be structured to serve them well and expand their skills through cross-training to be valuable in a range of positions. Leaders need to be intentional and strategic so that when the landscape changes, the agency can quickly adapt by assigning staff with the right skills where they are needed. In addition to a back to basics focus and improving organizational activity, agility, there is a need, a clear need to improve results. The first Kairos review was an important success, 
but it is one data point that needs to grow into a predictable pattern. Our regulatory actions should routinely be risk-informed, objective, and transparent. And our decisions should routinely be efficient, predictable, fair, and timely. Once again, lending stability to nuclear operations and planning. The agency has taken steps to be more risk-informed and has established a number of processes, many of which you're familiar with. Be risk smart, risk informed process for evaluations, very low safety significance resolution process, the backfit rule, and others. However, it's not clear that these processes are being used to their fullest potential. There is also room to expand our efforts. The bipartisan legislation passed by the House of Representatives included language instructing the NRC to report on risk informing our oversight and inspections after seeking input from the Secretary of Energy, National Labs, nuclear industry, and non-governmental organizations. However, we need not wait for congressional direction. It's within our authority to take this initiative now. We have over 20 years of experience with the reactor oversight process. This provides a wealth of data and an opportunity to use data-driven decision-making to risk inform, refine, and modernize our processes. Recently, the commission took an important step toward part 53, the risk informed performance-based regulatory framework for advanced reactors. This was congressionally mandated. This has been years in the development. This represents a considerable effort on the part of the staff, a considerable effort on the part of the staff at the commission. And, and reaching this step is an impressive accomplishment. However, I will say work remains. One area that deserves close attention is the area of managing cumulative risk. Management of cumulative risk has historically been accomplished by our power reactor licensees using their technical specifications. Enshrining a comprehensive risk metric in a rule is a step not previously taken by the agency in its history. I believe that this attempt will be fraught with complications when it comes time for implementation. And I would urge folks to consider Regulatory Issue Summary 2007-21 and the discussion of the Jordan Memo for those who have been around long enough to recall this. Uh, it was quite a bit of research recommended to me. I believe it's a useful case study. For 30 years, the agency struggled with how to define and enforce maximum thermal power due to the nature of how natural fluctuations, normal fluctuations in plant parameters can produce slight increases in thermal power. Licensing a comprehensive risk metric could easily result in similar pitfalls and complications in execution. I believe workshop and tabletop discussions will be crucial to exploring the practicality of implementing such a requirement. Subsequent license renewals are another opportunity to embody the principle that regulatory activities should be consistent with the degree of risk reduction they achieve. Given the agency's extensive license renewal experience, subsequent license renewal reviews should exhibit improved efficiency and expend fewer resources than was necessary for initial license renewals. The experience gained should produce a learning curve for later reviews to be more efficient based on the lessons learned in the previous ones. Further, the majority of aging management programs that are in place with regulatory approval and oversight for the first period of extended operations should largely remain valid for continued operation. So applicants should be credited for these and other regulatory programs like maintenance requirements so that the scope of the review should focus on new issues or those that are unique to the 60 to 80 year time frame. A key to improving results for these and many other issues, many other issues 
is the use of metrics as Commissioner and Wright and I have proposed to our colleagues. Meaningful, objective performance metrics for licensing activities would allow the agency to benchmark best practices, discover opportunities for process improvements, and refine budget estimates. This is especially relevant as the agency conducts first-of-a-kind reactor licensing reviews that are likely to bear higher costs than later reviews. Improved performance management will help verify whether there is a learning curve leading to more efficient, consistent, and predictable reviews. Shouldn't we want to have metrics? Shouldn't we want to improve our efficiency, predictability, and timeliness? Shouldn't we want to know where we can improve? And shouldn't we want to know whether or not we're actually demonstrating progress? We as an agency need to set clear, aggressive, but achievable goals. We need to track performance with meaningful metrics to achieve improved results. Metrics are essential to inform leadership and guide management on how best to demonstrate the agency's agility and improve the agency's execution. Demonstrating efficient, predictable, and timely reviews aligns with congressional expectations and is important to maintaining stakeholder confidence in the agency's effectiveness. I also believe that demonstrating we can achieve timely reviews and celebrating those successes is vital to improving staff morale. In 2008 and 2009, when the agency was rated the best place to work in the federal government, it was the start of the nuclear renaissance when the agency faced a high workload with high expectations. The agency continues to have bright and capable staff today, and I'm confident they will strive to meet the goals that we set for them. Achieving and celebrating such success is an essential element to job satisfaction, to staff engagement, and to pride in the agency. Mahatma Gandhi said, it's not just words, actions express priorities. Becoming a modern risk-informed regulator should not be an aspirational soundbite. It's a necessity to successfully execute our safety and security mission. I believe the agency should reassert the importance of licensing as principle to our mission improve our agility in responding to fact of life changes, use data to track our efficiency and guide performance improvements, and hold ourselves accountable for achieving results. Our country's need for electricity is, is going to require significant new generation. For nuclear energy to play a significant role, the NRC must become more efficient, predictable, and timely in its licensing actions. The administration and Congress expects it, and our country needs it. Our actions need to express our priorities. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes to speak as a woman in the nuclear field. IAEA just had a wonderful celebration of International Women's Day here in the US. <clears throat> it's Women's History Month. I'm glad to see Chair Hansen is engaging on women's issues with several of our international colleagues on a, pan, on a panel during the RIC. Director General Magwood is continuing his work on gender balance and mentoring programs encouraging young women to pursue careers in nuclear. DG Magwood has long been a champion for women, and I'm immensely grateful for his advice during my career. Unlike DG Magwood, I'm a latecomer to the discussion of women in the workplace. My eyes were opened over a year ago on the challenges women face, and I'm going to recap the revelation, the start of my journey with a couple of events. Shortly after I was confirmed for my second term, I found myself getting nuke-splained. Someone with significantly less technical experience, technical and policy experience, talked to me as if I was clueless about an issue I've monitored for years. It was frustrating and demeaning, but I let it go and redirected the conversation to a different topic. I didn't want to be difficult. Later that night, I reflected on the experience, and I was frustrated. And then came the revelation. 
if this is still happening to me at my stage, at, at this stage in my career, how many other women must also be struggling? Not long after that experience, I ran into Romina Velshi, our colleague from Canada, who, as many of you know, is an amazing leader and so inspirational on this issue. I couldn't wait to share my story. She listened and then asked, so what did you do about it? That was a wake-up call. What had I done about it? Nothing. Same approach I'd taken for my entire career. I didn't want to be difficult. I just ignored it and plowed forward. Shortly after that, I was in a meeting and I watched a woman struggle repeatedly to speak up and contribute, at which point I also tried to speak up and struggled. It really hit home for me how women in those situations are faced with a dilemma. Do they assert themselves, make that contribution to the discussion, and risk being labeled difficult or even worse, aggressive? Or do they play it safe, sit quietly, and let it go? For how long have how many women tried so hard not to be difficult? Well, here is what Jane Goodall has to say about that. It actually doesn't take much to be a difficult woman. That's why there are so many of us. <laughs> Ladies, there is strength in numbers. There are a lot of us, and we need to support each other. We need to find ways to encourage each other as we advance our careers, mentor each other with strategies on how to be effective in the workplace, be allies that speak up for each other when we see, when we see others struggle. Otherwise, the challenges we face today will remain for our daughters to confront during their careers. Consider this example. A woman recently relayed a situation where she was told, you're just lucky to have a seat at the table. Because I've started to speak out on these issues, women are reaching out and sharing their experiences with me. And my first thought upon hearing that was the same with all the other experiences that have been shared with me. I'm just dumbfounded. And all I can think is, seriously? In this day and age? One thing is for sure. That's not the voice of leadership. That's not the voice of collaboration. That's intimidation. It says know your place. It says be seen and not heard. For all those around the table who observe and stay silent, it becomes an endorsement. Acquiesce and perpetuate that culture. While I'm speaking as a woman and relaying a woman's experience, I expect other minorities and gender non-conforming people have likely experienced similar dynamics. I think one part of the solution is the same for all. The challenge for leadership across the nuclear field is to truly create a healthy, collaborative environment that welcomes all contributions. How do we, how do we create an environment that encourages everyone to reach their full potential? How do we support them, develop their skills, and give them the tools to be competitive so that they become the obvious choice to sit at the table? that their contributions are valued and sought after. My advice for everyone is start by having a career goal. If you don't know where you're going, you may end up somewhere else. Yes, in addition to your roles as spouse, parent, employee, chef, chauffeur, dog walker, class parent, soccer coach, and everything else, Find the time to make a plan. You are your best asset, and having a plan is an investment in your future. Beyond that, seize opportunities to sharpen your skills. Build your network of people who empower and support you. Find mentors, accept their help, and learn all you can from them, and be brave. Nobel Peace Prize winner Wangari Mathai said, finally, I was able to see that if I had a contribution to make, I must do it. 
despite what others said, that I was okay the way I was, and that it was all right to be strong. Few of us are as brave and strong as Wangari, but I encourage you all, be as brave and strong as you can. That concludes my remarks. Well, thank you, Commissioner, for those remarks. Um, very inspiring. Um, we do have a number of questions that have come in, so if you're ready, we can go ahead and dive in. Okay? Sure. So in your comments, you discussed some of the legislation that could, uh, before Congress, that could affect the NRC. Could you provide a perspective on what those effects could be and whether there are any actions the bills would direct that do you feel the NRC should could and should work on proactively even if they do not become law? Some of the provisions, I think, that are particularly in common to both bills, we already have the authority and are working um, quite significantly on. There is hiring authority that both bills include um, that is unique and has not been pursued before for the agency, um, new authority, if you will. Um, but honestly, we've hired 600 people in the last two years. So while I think that, that presents a challenge for knowledge management um, to welcome all of these people and help them network and train and become valued employees, um, I believe that's something that we are working on today and doing very constructively. Uh, I think the risk informing that is contained in the House bill is certainly something that we can look at mm -hmm. and pursue now. Um, I also think to a certain extent some of what's directed in terms of um, evolving our mission statement, I think some of the seeds of that probably already reside in our Office of Reactor Regulation. Um, I think more, in, more fully embracing our, um, our ability to make the safe use of nuclear energy possible is a step in that direction. So I think those, um, those are all, I think, important provisions that we could think about how to uh, begin taking Congress's direction to heart and begin working in that direction even while we await passage of, of that legislation. Okay, thank you. I have a question here that says, uh, thank you for your grounding perspective on the mission of the NRC. Adapting implies agility to pivot to meet the moment with efficiency and predictability. To do that requires strong leadership to implement at all levels. What do you view is necessary to achieve this paradigm shift in order to meet the predicted licensing demands? I think we have a lot of stated intent <clears throat> I think a lot of what the chairman talked about in terms of his optimism and his trust is very relevant. But I think to a certain extent, uh, we need our leadership to take that to heart and take it the next step, not just discuss it and talk about it, but to actually lead by example and execute and, and by doing so and having that focus walking the walk, inspire those um, employees in their organization to do the same. I think that is a key to beginning to not just improve the trust in leadership and not just to improve our performance, um, but to, in a basic sense, begin to improve our culture mm -hmm. just by understanding and respecting leaders when they are not just talking about the right example, but when they are walking the walk. Thank you for that, and our time is drawing to a close, but let me ask one last question here. Power uprates are now economically feasible due to the incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act. What is your perspective on the NRC's role in enabling sizable power uprates that are larger than historically completed uprates? 
I think this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate our agility. Uh, in many ways, we have known for years that subsequent license renewals would be coming and were notified by licensees that they would be filing applications. Mm. Um, I think the difficulty in environmental reviews, I, I hope we will be turning a corner at some point soon. Um, but I think there are a lot of lessons there if, if those license reviews need to become risk informed at this point when we already have so many underway. It's a lesson to, uh, to, to look at our needs for and our processes for power operate reviews to dust them off, to begin making sure we have enough people trained and in place to do that. It's been a while since we've, since we've conducted power operates and, and there's an opportunity for us here to demonstrate results better than we have on subsequent license renewal. So that's an opportunity, I think, both for leadership and agility across the board. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and, and thanks again for your, for your, for your remarks. <laughs>